peace and blessings to you. My name is Jerry B. I am the entree musician, but you know what? So are you. And the person, the brother sitting on the left side of your screen, we're going to elevate him to the ultra entree musician. Because I tell you what, when you look at the body of work and the projects that this man has been a part of, first of all, Merlin, I don't know where to begin. And if I should begin, I don't know where to end. I mean, <laughs> Stevie Wonder, Sting, Nine Inch Nails, Shania Twain, the Disney movie, Enchanted, Sega, video games, former professor a voice at Berkeley College mm -hmm. of Music, now at the New School, now at NYU, teaching at Clive Davis's Institute. Where do you stop? It's uh, Marlon Saunders, man. Marlon Saunders, welcome to the Entree Musician, brother. Uh, brother, thank you so much for having me. No, thank, um, you. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a pleasure to, you know, to be here. It's a pleasure to see you. It's a pleasure to be able to spend time with you again and share. Um, you know, it's, it's wonderful to be able to do what we do. Yeah, it is. You know, be able to think that we, uh, wake up every day and our day is inspired by what is coming through us. Or as I like to say a lot of times, what's being downloaded, you know, into us, if we are you know, able to open, open and be receptive to that. That's, that in itself for me is, um, a joy, you know, beyond anything to know like, wow, this, what's coming through me, what's, what's being said in my mind. And I get to sit down and work with other people to create, or I get to sit down and journey with young artists to help them discover who they are. That alone is a gift, man. We get to do this, which is amazing. It's, it's really amazing because uh, the, and the thing about your spirit is, is this, I think we, we were talking before trying to determine when our paths first crossed. And it was in New Jersey for the right. Soul Patrol Awards, right? Uh, 2003, uh, God bless Bob Davis, man, yeah. Kevin Amos, and everybody who keeps Soul Patrol on the tracks. But Absolutely. that's when our paths first crossed. And you had this incredible album out called Enter My Mind, which I don't know if you want to bat a thousand and just get it out of the ballpark i believe that's what that album did not mm -hmm. just for you and not just because that music was downloaded into your spirit but for the atmosphere that it created for everybody who heard it and mm -hmm. i was i was beyond impressed and i mean that look man i don't have to say nothing i don't mean my nose is brown enough right <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean but that inner my mind was was that was uh, another uh, step in saying, you know, this music matters. The music of Stevie Wonder, of Donny Hathaway, of Roberta Flack, of introspection matters. And I think you hit it hard. So just that conversation alone took me to another place. So I am grateful for everything that has happened to you in these, what has it been now, 17 years? Yes, years, man. Wow. It's, We've it's, been knowing each other for 17 years now. That's, a, that's incredible. It's amazing. And then in 2010, when after, you know, Billy Joel and, and Nine Inch Nails and Sting and all of these projects that you were blessed to work on, to be able to answer my call and remember our humble beginnings and say, yo, man, Jerry, yeah, we can write a song together. And we did that just yeah. think, you know what I mean? And collaborated yeah. on that. It just, we can it get just it the, the spirit. We tried, man. And you know the timing, the rhythm that you gave me to move within that spoke, yeah. spoke volumes. It's amazing. It's amazing. And and that a remix of that is coming out again. Sure. We're going to talk about that a little bit more, but <laughs> but that is coming back out because it has to be showcased. Uh, you know, again, I think especially with the cultural climate that we're currently experiencing. You know, Absolutely. let's give the world love. That message need to ha needs to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. But tell me, how did you start your musical journey, brother? You know, I actually, uh, like so many of us, you know, you just, I grew up uh, listening to music in my home, you know, uh, mainly R&B, gospel. It was pretty much in my house, R&B, soul, gospel. Um, 
but then I kind of gravitated towards instruments. You know, I started playing piano. I sang in church since I was like five, but uh, I played piano. And then when I was nine, I started playing saxophone. Mm. So I was just really, really, you know, into, into music and studying and, and uh, trying to figure it all out. And so while I was, you know, studying and they were teaching you, you know, through classical, I was also, you know, in church involved, so figuring it out, learning by ear. But I was just always into, you know, soul music, Stevie, Donnie, uh, Quincy Jones, that sounds and stuff like that record changed my life. I remember I was probably like 11 or 12 or so, but sitting down and hearing this and thinking, wow, how is this possible? Like how are all these sounds and all of these uh, harmonies and all of these things coming together with beautiful music that's soulful, but it's jazzy, but he's found this way to put it together. So that for me was the first place that I realized like, I don't know how to do this, but this is what I want to do. I have no idea how to do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I do. So I, I love the music and, uh, and then Sheik, when, I, when that Sheik came out and, and I heard those harmonies and I heard the singing, and, uh, I was like, how, how, who are these people? Diva Grave, you yeah. know, Luther Vangelis, Fonzie, but who are these people? How are they doing this job? You know, and uh, I just kind of you know, tried to figure it out, went to school. Uh, first I went to classical conservatory in, in Peabody. I stayed for like a year mm -hmm. and I was like, Nah, this is good. I feel it, but you know this Luther record now, Busy Body. I need to like find out like who who's doing that. <laughs> and, you know, look, listen to this. A brief Martin, what he's doing with Shaka Khan on this. Like, how is this happening? That's right. And and so I, you know, I uh, ended up at Berkeley, and it was like that was the way in. They were like, yo, we have studios, we have classes, and so for me, I was like, okay. I'm getting a little closer. Like I want to be in that in that world, that session world. Yeah. And Berkeley helped me, you know, in terms of learning how to be there. And then I just made the decision: I'm going to move to New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, just moved. Didn't really have any connections, and just kind of struggled and and figured it out. And then um, I landed my first gig. My first big big gig was actually uh, Samantha Fox. Mm. Mm -hmm. And someone, uh, Nunzio Signore, a guitar player that went yeah. to Berkeley, she wanted a, a black male singer who could dance. And so yeah. he was like, call him in. So I auditioned. It's supposed to be a three month gig, man. Wow. And it ended up being 11 months because the single was, every, as we were touring, the single was, you know, reaching, reaching number one, reaching number one. So because of that gig, I got to see the world. Wow. You know, I had never had a passport and like, the second month into the gig, they were like, yo, you got to get a passport. So I hustled back to New York, got a passport, and we, I went all over the world with her. Wow. And um, that's how I started. And then I was able to come back, take some time off, you know, and kind of think about the next path and trying to break into that session world because I really wanted to break into that session world. Yeah, yeah. So I had time to hustle. I had time to take my demo around. And then I met, uh, this was the most amazing gig. I called. Uh, for Stepping Into Tomorrow, which was run by Atala Shabazz uh -huh. and um, Yolanda King. And they were looking for, it was like a theater company that went around to uh, various black communities and, and we went into prisons and we just gave performances. Yeah. And they needed, a, the call was to have someone come in to just play. They were looking for various actors to just play for the audition. So I called up, you I saw this in the Amsterdam news. I'm wondering if you still need somebody. And it was Atala on the phone, Shabazz. She was like, yeah, come through. And so I went in and I played. And in between we were talking and she was like, you know, we have a piano player, but there's some gigs that he can't do. So I ended up being involved with that for like years. Oh and my just, God. Can you imagine? It was like her, Yolanda, uh, Sherry Belafonte, Cherry Portier, you know, all these, all these amazing people, Stanley Wayne Mathis, uh, I, forget the, I forget his name, but he played Huggy Bear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all, Antonio Fargus. And, Antonio, Antonio yeah. Fargus, all yeah. on this gig, man. Wow. So 
yeah, it was like, and just learning from that and figuring it out. And so in between that, I was able to kind of move my way into the session world. Like one of my, the first big gig I got that called me was for like a Miller Lite commercial. And so I went in thinking, oh, wow, I'm going to be singing today. And, you know, I saw there and I was like, that looks, that's Patty Austin. I think that's, that's Fonzie Thornton, that's Diva Gray and a couple other people on it. But I was like, like I was, you know, like playing the NBA or something, you know? <laughs> And so I said to the lady, I'm going to sing with them. And she was like, nah, they're going to sing. They're singing backgrounds for you. You're singing the lead. And I was like, what? And that kind of changed everything. That was like the moment where I got that commercial. The commercial ran for a couple of years and I got another commercial. And then I started being called in to sing with them. For me, that was the key to, to be able to sing with Fonzie and, and, and Diva. And, yeah. and then I met you know, Tawatha Eiji and I have to say this, Tawatha Eiji and Fonzie have been my mentors in, in my industry, in this industry for me. Fonzie, from the first time I met him, he took me aside and he gave me his number and he said, you call me and he explained everything of how it worked, what needed to happen. Then Tawatha did the same thing, you know, mm -hmm. so I've been really blessed and it, it, it's been one of those things where it's, it's like a dream come true to think like, like she called me last week. She was like, Hey, what you doing? I'm, I'm working on this. I need you to your help. It's like when it's Martha Asia's on the phone. Oh yeah, and by the way, you know, uh, Lisa Fish is coming. Well, I was like, man, these are my friends. Like this is like, you know what I mean? It's it's kind of like you. It is a dream. Yes, you get to live. You know, man, that is that's absolutely fantastic. And you didn't think that when you were listening to Busy Body that you were going to actually be working with Fonzie from that, you know? Because exactly. you, know, you know, long time Luther background singer helping to arrange yeah. a lot of the vocals that were happening in that. Absolutely, man. And Tawaka and Tume, Lisa Fisher with absolutely everybody. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, you see your phone and they're calling you and you're like, yeah, this is good. That is this good. Is good. Tell me about yeah, the man. journey with, uh, with Bobby McFerrin and Voicestra and the uh, project uh, Spiritual. Uh, how, how did that hook? You know, um, Bobby's manager, Linda, came to see a vocal group that I was part of around the same time that I was doing Jazz Hole uh, called uh, Sepia. And it was for four um, singers, Arif St. Michael, Lenora Zenzeli Helm, and Rosa Russ. And so we kind of basically covered the African diaspora in terms of what we, what we did, you know, and so... Linda came because she she was recommended to see us in case she made one of the managers. And uh, so we talked with her and it wasn't a, a good fit, but she then called because Bobby was going on the road and they were looking to have some of the singers. And so I kind of she called and I said, yeah, you know, and so the first two gigs were the audition. Because gotcha. you know, I went out, it was with Circle Songs, the Circle Songs record. And so... Yeah. I called and was like, so what do I have to learn? She was like, yeah, just put it on, you know, listen to it while you're cleaning. I was like, what the heck is this? Like, you know, I was like, okay, what do you wear? Whatever you want, Bobby, we're gonna come out maybe with a t-shirt and jeans and, you know, maybe his shoes off. And I'm thinking, and I'm used to like, you wear this, this is what you do. So I got the gig and, and, and um, stayed on the gig for a while. And it was a beautiful experience, incredible uh, singers, incredible singers. And all of it coming off of the top of his head. You know, he's just making it up. There's 12 of us, him included, sitting around, and he would create and build things, and some of us would step out. And so uh, when Spiritual came out, Linda just called and said, hey, you know, Bobby is doing this record. Lisa's going to be there. Uh, Latanya, can you come through and sing on it? And I was like, absolutely. You know. And uh, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> and, my gosh. So, so, you know, I mean, we, we could, we could literally do this all night because Michael Jackson, <laughs> <laughs> Wonder. I mean, can you give some snapshots of what those uh, moments were like? you toured with Stevie actually on the songs in the key of life. Tour. Yeah. So yeah, give, us, give us a snapshot. That's the crazy thing. You know, it's one of those things where we said, you know, before we started that we are blessed in the fact that we just kind of get up and uh, in the midst of it all, we're just in the moment of what's going to happen. And 
I honestly have learned this through my own experience. It's like, the more that I'm just in that place of gratitude and just awe and yeah. like, you know what, God's face, you got it. Right. I'm just going to like and, uh, just co-create with you, whatever you send. I'm going to kind of do my best. So I had, I was actually, I had finished working with Sam Smith and I had put two of the singers that I had for that choir on his tour and they had just come back. And so, they were meeting with me and they called me Papa. They're like, oh, Papa, what was going on? So we, they took me out to lunch. So in the middle of me walking to meet them, I get a call. They're like, ah, you know what, Stevie is coming to New York. He's starting off his first, the first gig he's doing for the tour will be Madison Square Garden. Your name has come up as a contractor. Would you be interested? First, they were like, and it's going to be about 30, you know, 30 singles. So I'm walking, thinking like, okay, yeah, but I'm thinking. Then they call back. 10 minutes later, wow. it's going to be more like uh, 20 singers. Then I'm like, okay. Then they're like, we're going to make it more like, you know, 15 singers. Can you do this? And, I, and they gave me the specs. And I'm like, yeah. And they were like, okay, so we're going to call you back in a couple. You know, you give us the number and we'll see if we can work. So I gave the number. Everything was fine. I get to the restaurant and I say to Kristen Brooks and uh, Dorian, I said, you guys want to do a gig with Stevie? They were like, what? I was like, yeah, we'll do Madison Square Garden. And so I had to put together, they wanted a choir that was kind of, you know, some young, some seasoned. And I was like, so I think you want to do this gig. Biddy Stein, you want to do this gig. So in my mind, I was like, this has to be the baddest choir because it's Madison Square Garden is New York. And so I put the choir together and, you know, we did the, uh, we did the uh, uh, sound check. Yeah. And he, he was like, yeah, we're good. We did like, we hit um, a little bit of Pastime Paradise and then we did the gig. Everything was cool. Everybody was there. And then the next day I got a call and they were like, you know, Steve wants you to do the tour. And man, I was walking to go to a birthday party and I just literally just fell to the side of the thing. Like they were like, okay, we need you to you send us to specs. And, but my mind was blown for like the rest of the day. I was like, can I call you like tomorrow? I can't even begin to talk about this now, <laughs> you know, and, you know what I mean, but you know, it's like, Absolutely. Oh, yeah, I can barely talk, but just to see this man's genius, man, and to experience it, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, we would have sound check, for instance, at four, he would be there like an hour before practicing. We do the sound check, we go eat, he practice. We do the gig. Now we're doing songs in the key of life. Right. This blew my mind. He did it every night, he did it the entire song, the entire records. Yeah. Never changed the key. Yeah. Never lowered the key. Never. Yeah. And then would, you know, see meet all of the the people that would come backstage, sign with them and talk. And so I was hanging with the sister who, you know, takes care of dressing him and all that. And we were talking about it was late, we were hanging out. She's like, oh, I, I really get to bed before five anyway. Like, Why? And she was like, well, after Stephen finishes with the signings and pictures, he practices for two hours. Wow. And then I go in after he's finished practicing and then I undress. And I just was like, yeah, like I can never complain about like, oh, I got to practice. <laughs> that level of excellence is like, you see, you understand that level of excellence. And that love of what we're speaking about. Yeah. Absolutely. Incredible. We uh we saw Stevie, my wife and I, and uh you were a part of that tour, um, the songs in the key of life when you guys were in Maryland in Baltimore. And uh it was oh, yeah. 20th, yeah, twentieth uh, wedding anniversary, and uh yeah, we're way up in the rafters. And the beauty of the entire auditorium singing along with Stevie and you guys on stage. It's just, it's nothing like it when thousands of people are just united. And that's the power of music. That's the power of his genius and his spirit. Crazy. Absolutely. Crazy. Just can unite everyone. And it doesn't matter the song. Everybody can sing the song. You may not be able to speak the language, but you can sing the song. Sing the song. You can hum the melody. That's right. right. Got it down. And that I think that night too, he was showcasing India Ari. Uh she came oh, yeah. and she was uh, you know, just really doing the hookup on 
on a lot of the stuff. It was it was a beautiful evening, man. Orchestra, part nine. Yeah, it was just powerful. powerful. All right, you gotta you gotta give me a Michael snapshot now. I mean, what was up with it? you know? <laughs> God bless him. Again, he's resting, but there. the king of pop. You know, one of these things where you get a call and they're like, "Hey, can you come in and sing on Michael's record?" He was doing the history record at the time. He's got some songs and he needs, he needs uh, some singers. Can you contract three other singers? And you're like, again, like, uh, yeah. <laughs> but you're thinking, There's no no. There's no no to that question. There's no no, but you kind of, kind of, you kind of like fall on the wall. Like, is this really happening? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so it was great. And we go in and we sing and he's meticulous and he knows exactly you know, what he wants, but he was very, very open. Shy, but very, very open in the sense of uh, listening and, and, and sure of what he wanted. That's the thing I really remembered about that. So, so tell me then, how do you go from a situation where, I'll say this, where you, you, you know that you have this knower in you because the intuition of growing up with black music, soul music, gospel, you have that. And then you go from a Michael Jackson to a nine inch nails or a <laughs> twain or a stink, you know, tell, tell me, or Billy Joel, you know, tell me about that process. Although, you know, sting and Billy Joel are very, very soulful. I would imagine. No, I hear it too. But nine inch nails, tell me what type of what's going on mentally or emotionally as you're going from that gig to a, to a Nine Inch Nails gig? You know, it's an interesting thing. Um, I had always wanted to be a session singer. That to me was, I loved the idea of being able to be on records and, and tour and to be able to get different sounds. So I think one of the things that helped was the fact that, you know, when I got into the session world in the 90s, it was like you were moving, moving, moving to one job to the next job. So you had to, you know, go in and you had to be able to sing Maybe you had to sing a lead that had to be have more of a Motown sound. Or then they wanted me to be a voice to men. But then I had to go and be in the group and sing smooth so it could be like for a, a, a car commercial or something. Right. So the, the trick of the trade was learning how to change your voice when you need it. You need to have it changed. And, uh, you know, Fonzie Tawatha, Diva Gray, Vanny's Thomas, uh, Janice Pendarvis, um, Dennis Collins, Daryl Tooks, uh, Curtis King. These were masters. These were the people that I sang and learned from when I came in. So they were able to teach me and to show me like how to get the different qualities and how to get the different sounds. And, and then I would just kind of listen and observe and watch. So I was learning on the gig. You know, I was learning on the job of how to kind of get the sounds and how to change the tones. And I was a big nerd, you know. Here I am, this kid, 20, I came in at 25, and I was like asking them all the time, oh, I remember when you were on this record, you sang the soprano, you said, they'd be like, okay, calm down, let's just, let's just get the job done, then we'll talk. <laughs> so I was always listening to, to, the, to the voices and emulating it. And with the Nine Inch Nail, the funny thing is they called because they saw me in a video with something I had done with that artist she's from i think she's from sweden called robin and they were looking for they were doing a TV thing and they wanted a they saw me and they wanted the black um, male singer yeah so when they called i was actually growing my hair out when they called and they said um we want you for this gig this is what it's paying da, 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 da. but do you still have your head shaved and i was like nah nah i'm growing up they were like well if you want this gig you have to shave your head for this gig mm-hmm. and i was like i want yeah. <laughs> so I shaved the head and um I, did I, the gig and you and uh it was one of those things where I was singing like very, very high, but you know, it's funny because it's like unless it's a gospel squall or something like that, we don't sing with a lot of that art and that rock and roll thing that they have. Sure. So I, I it was actually an amazing learning experience for me to figure out the and the guitar player taught me how to do it of like opening the throat and sending a lot of air and shoving the note through the air. So it was like shoving the air through the, through, through the, over right. the chord. Yeah. So for me, it was cool to do a gig, but it was just so cool to learn. Yeah. A different, a different way of how to, to, to work that vocal mechanism in that way. It was cool, man. Man. Yeah. 
that's 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 fantastic and like i said we we could actually do this all night but i i, I do have uh, several questions for you because i think in the series that um that we've entered into when um when we go into the entree musician podcast we're talking about the spirit of music so i want to get into that a little bit but i need to ask you with all of the all of the experiences that you've had with so many different artists would is there a moment or a time that you thought okay this is it this is the pinnacle of who marlon saunders is in this moment is captured the dream come true what, what was that moment and what artists were you working with it could have been your own project with the seamless voice so yeah was there you that know, I I think there've been um, there a couple, if I may. Yeah. Uh, uh, Stevie, that was like, yeah, this is it. That moment for me was uh, incredible. Uh, I have to also say, you know, uh, I did Enchanted and, and the song was nominated for Academy Award. So I got to not only go, but because it was nominated for an Academy Award, I got to perform. So yeah. that was a pinnacle as well. Like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm performing at the Academy Awards? Like, what? So that was a moment. Um, I think another moment for me was for Enter My Mind when I called Tawatha and asked if she would sing on my record. And Tawatha came and my best friend, who was also in CPR, Arif St. Michael, he sang. So the three of us sang. He couldn't sleep the whole night because... He was just like, Tawaf is coming to sing tomorrow. I don't even know what I'm going to do. I was like, you know what you're going to do right now? You're going to get off this phone. <laughs> three in the morning. And you call me and I got to get to sleep. Where? And then I also called Collins and, and Fonzie Thornton to come to sing. So those moments to have them on my record was pretty phenomenal. Yeah. And then to run into Fonzie and Luther on the street. And Luther had heard the record and congratulated me on the record so that was kind of like yeah that's a good that's a good that's a good space that's a good space and i just finished an ep that's coming out in october called meditate on a dream and i have to say we john uh manny is the producer who did it and we basically did it you know he's in rhode island and i'm here so we did it remotely yeah. and talking about where we are in 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 the world today I really feel really um, good about this EP. I feel like that we just wrote and created from the moment. Yeah. Every bit of it was completely from the moment. Wow. And uh, yeah, I guess I, I kind of felt like, wow. But this is it. This is, this is where we are right now, this moment in time. This is, we, this is what we're saying and this is it. And I feel it and it, and you, and you know how, like, when you grow it, you know, when you're first getting into the industry, and especially, like, coming with Jazz Soul and, and with Sepia, and then when you do Into My Mind, you're writing, certainly you're writing because you're writing from what's the truth, but you're also writing in conjunction of, I want to, this record has to do this, and I need to get it here, and I need to do that. Right. You're putting all that in. But I think when you, when you had an opportunity to be in the industry in a while, and something comes through you, and you're just doing it, and there was... No, nothing except the fact that we got to get this out. We got to get it out of us and, 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 and create it. Man, it's just, it's a blessing. It is a blessing. It is. Man, that is, that's fantastic. Now I'm going to flip it on you and say, conversely, what, what would you find would have been your most challenging moment or challenging experience? Or were you, were in the moment and felt like, oh, this is rough, but you look back in the rear view mirror and say, I've learned the most because I had to walk through this. What, what, do you, what do you think that was? You know, I, I think for me, one of the most challenging periods was I moved to LA in 2007 and I was there from 2007 to 2011. And so the transition for me was just leaving New York and, and, and starting over and, and trying to figure it all out from a different perspective. Sure. You know, I had been in New York and and I had it here, but I was like in LA and LA was fine. I figured it out and I got it, but it was a different feel for me. It was a different sense of like, to be honest with you, but I actually found myself traveling back <laughs> to New York and it, like pretty much every month. 
Wow. And uh, just to get your bearings down, about you, so to speak. I keep my bearings. It just I don't. I, I just kind of felt like mm, New York. I knew it, but I was still there. So finally, Mr. Bond said to me, Atula said to me, "If you're going to be here, you can't keep going back. You know, you're going to have to commit to being here." You know, you go back maybe if it's a big gig, but you can't keep going back every month like you're doing. And so I did that, and then I was able to kind of appreciate it and to begin to see it and understand it. But that was a real challenge for me wow. to really have to figure out how to make, you know, sense of how I'm going to move and maneuver in L.A. And people are calling you like, yo, Marlon, we got this gig. Can you come? But, no, nah, I'm not here now. I'm in, <laughs> in L.A. And to figure out it and, and develop, you know, the relationship there. But, so um, where, where are you based at now? Yeah, that was, I'm where, back in New York. You're back in New York. So what was the, what was the decision that made you come back uh, East? The relationship that I was in at the time, we had to come back because of work. Gotcha. So that's what was like, okay, we're, it, it didn't take much. It was like, we got to go back to New York. I was like, okay, let's pack it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's real cool, man. That yeah. that's cool, man. I, I I really appreciate you sharing your journey with us. And uh, the oh, one thing yeah. that I really wanted to pick your brain about, uh, you know, if, if I could, and I, I was asked this question actually two weeks ago uh, about Mar Marlon Saunders. Uh, the question was, if you can describe Marlon's music in one word, what word? Mm -hmm. And I said, soul. I mean, it is actually the expression of truth. Marlon sings from a place where you feel like you know him after the, the groove begins on the record. You just, you, you feel like, hey, I know this guy. I can identify with wow. him. Uh, it's something that, I know this is more than one word, I know, but the word was soul. But the thing about it is, it's not a contrived, made up situation with you. So when we were laying the groundwork for this series, and we, we entitled it The Spirit of Music, we wanted to take the approach that there's something else going on here. When you define music, when you, when you know that you can see a little toddler who doesn't know anything dancing to the rhythm, that there, there's something else going on here. When you can go from a nine inch nails to a, uh, you know, a Dr. Dre or a, Quincy Jones, or you know, I mean, what's actually or D, sound doctor? <laughs> where, where you, you know, where is this stuff coming from? So, I wanted to know what could you, Marlon, give a definition to the spirit of music? What, what is that download? How can you harness that? Can you put that in words for us from your perspective? Yeah, you know, first. I just want to thank you for just the words you used to describe, you know, me. Um, I appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. Um, when I think about when, how you just were describing that, the download, the being able to shift the movement, the child being affected, for me, it's, it just lets me know that it's something that is greater than me. It is something that is greater than anything I think that humans can compartmentalize, categorize, or try to, it, it's greater than that. And I think for me, what I've discovered is the more that I can allow myself to be nobody, no thing, nowhere, no place, the more that it has access to come through. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I think whatever that, whatever that, connective thing that we are that energetic that vibration that resonance that that eternal universal intelligent pulse is yeah. once we are able to realize and to allow ourselves to open and to free ourselves we actually then become connected to that pulse yeah and then what happens is we are able to be used yeah. we're able to be to receive all the information because one of the things as you know uh, Michael Bernard Beckwith says, when we're able to free ourselves that open, then we have no static. There's nothing within the portal. The portal is free. The portal is free because we're not questioning. We're not doubting. We're not judging ourselves. We're not doing anything except saying, I am nothing. I am no one. I am no place. I am just complete, eternal 
spirit. I am complete soul. I am complete essence. And then once that happens, oh my God. I gotta call you back. I gotta call you back. I gotta call you back. What? what? I gotta call you back. And then you then you go and then you're like, oh, you know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. That, that notion. And um, you know, we see it. We see it in genius. We see that in Steve. You, you, yeah. you see that that he and to be be there and to know that he's being he's being used in that way. You see it, you know, when we watch the artistry of Michael Jordan, when you see LeBron James, you see that there is something, there's an essence that's happening, that's coming through that is greater than anything we could possibly know. Yeah, you know, we, we see that when you see, you know, John Coltrane. I mean, I was listening to uh, Love Supreme. My yeah. God, it's just like, <laughs> it's so dense, it's so dense, it's so dense, it's so dense, but the more you sit and you listen, and every time you go back, there's another level of the layer. You look, you think about the writings of Toni Morrison, it's the same. Something was coming through James Baldwin. How is it that James Baldwin was writing in the 50s, in the 60s, and we are now just vibrating on what he was saying? Just yeah. now. Yes, yeah. it's spirit. You know, or the, the genius of like Steve, I remember we were in, in on Stevie tour, we were in um, Nashville. Steven Tyler came on the stage with Stevie and they were doing Superstition. And to watch these two men, you know, who are in their mature age now, yeah, yeah. bro, they became 12. It was like, like Steven Tyler was jumping and up and down around Stevie, grabbing him, holding him, but they were like, and their voices went to a place that I stopped singing because I was like, I cannot believe that these notes are coming out of these guys right now. Wow. Completely open, completely free, completely just beyond. Right. And I, I think I want to share another thing that sure. happens because of my mother's side of the family, the Walkers, the Walker family. My mother's side of the family is the Walker family, um, and they were all preachers. But the interesting thing about them is you could, they never lost, you could feel the Africanness in everything they did. They never lost it through slavery and all, yeah. all of that. They kept it. It's, so as a kid growing up in this old wooden church, this is one of my first memories. I had to be a maybe that I can remember it probably four, three, somewhere in there. I'm holding my mama's hand. My sister's holding her other hand. Now we knew, my sister and I, Monique and I knew our great, great grandparents. We knew our great, great grandmother and great, great grandfather. Of course, they're bent over. Now when the church service was starting, they, the music that was playing at the time was sweeping through the city. And this is, and they were bent over, but when they caught the spirit, they literally dropped the cane, raised up, and ran around the church. Wow. Once the, once the spirit left, they would bend over. So it would be like my Uncle Morris, my Aunt Gert, my Grand Corps, all of them. Papa was completely 6'1, stood straight until he died at 93. Wow. Never was bent over. But they would literally then come back into their body. So this memory is a very familiar memory, and I shared it with someone uh, maybe a year ago. But before I did, I called my sister. I said, do you remember going to church when Grand Corps and them would run around the church? I didn't want to force them. She said, yeah, they would drop. They would just run and drop, and then at the end, they fall back down. And I said, you remember that? She goes, of course I remember. Then I called my cousin Joan to see if she remembered it. She says, oh, it happened all the time. And they would catch the spirit. They So in my mind, I knew Something is greater going on here. Right, right, right. Something is happening. And it would happen, brother, yes. when the music happened. Yes, yes. There's something in the music that evokes something. That's why they took the drums away. Yes. That's why they took the drums away when they came here. Mm -hmm. Yes. I understand. You know. I understand. There's something in there that is evoked within the spirit, within the resonance, the vibration of energy throughout, I believe, throughout the universe. Exactly. Now, that, that, that is real, real interesting that you say that because, you know, it, uh, your, your grandparents, what they were feeling and the energy that just ignited them. And by the way, for history's sake, that was the Ward sisters uh, sweeping through the city. That was clearly yeah, well, the Ward sisters. So, you know, just yeah. that black history on point. Uh, that's what that song was. But to stand and 
stand them up, you know, uh, where they're erect in their body, where their spirit has just locked onto something. It's just, it's dynamite. It's indescribable. You, you cannot yes. say that there's right. not another element that's going on here. Absolutely. Yeah, there's another element. But as I do, and I want to make sure that we're as total as possible in the discussion. So um, conversely, the the spirit of music, there is to me, and I, I do want your perspective on there, especially there was an era in the early 90s, uh, early to mid 90s, where the spirit of music took a real dark turn, especially among our people, because there was a genre of gangster rap that came. And I remember actually being a mentor to a lot of kids at the time, teenagers, who were like, well, yo, Jerry, we just love the beat, but I'm saying something is going on here because now our brothers and sisters are starting to war against each other. When, when hip hop first came out, it was about fun. It was about some beef. It was about a few DJs maybe battling on the tables and I'm the greatest, but it went to putting brothers' heads up. So can yep. you speak to that? Because that, again, there's another spirit that's going on. Yeah, I think that they, I like to think of it as sometimes things are hitting in a dissonance, in a dissonance. And we know, you know this brother, because you, you studied music and you understand most times when there is a dissonance, there's an intention for the dissonance. There is because music brings us to a place where we need to be emotionally moved, emotionally stirred, but we wait for the resolution. Yes. The resolution is the place where we do that. So that's, that's like everything in the universe, light, dark, up, down, yeah. you know. But when you're creating a dissonance upon dissonance upon dissonance upon dissonance upon dissonance with no resolution, <laughs> then you're left with all the things of this. You did. And you know I what's did. interesting about this whole, you know what's interesting about this whole era that happened too, brother? All of a sudden, we have dissonance, but then we also, which never happened in our community, had people singing out tune on tracks. True. We never did that. True. It didn't even, it never, it, back in the day of Motown, that the pitch might be, may not have been accurate as we think of accurate today, correct. but we understood where they were going. They were resolving. That's correct. But we were ha we were literally having tracks where there would be a beat, there would be a, a bass playing in one key, and the singer would be in a completely different key. That's true. That's no true. resolution. Wow. No resolution. And so this whole notion of being able, I, and I honestly do believe this, Part of the thing, the essence of black music, a, a friend of mine, a great musician, Armstead Christian, he's, he's left us on this realm, used to always say the wonderful thing about black music is black music always was rooted in the blues. It always had dirt. It always had earth. Sure. But when you take all of that stuff out, there's a part of us then that's disconnected. Yes. Again, dissonance is put in there. Yes. That's that's an incredible perspective. In fact, uh, one of the uh, beautiful spirits I'll be interviewing as part of this series, and this will be his second interview with me, but that is uh, Gary Hines of the Sounds of Blackness. And the one thing that was yeah. interesting yeah. about the Sounds of Blackness music during that same time where we were hitting dissonance, their stuff was coming out to be not necessarily the counter of it, but to say, yo, this is solution here. This absolutely. Is you know, keep as long as you keep your head to it, it balanced it. <laughs> it helped us balance. Exactly. It, it helped to balance us. That's what I'm saying. There was something that was like when we heard that, it was just like, whoa, right. relief. <laughs> <laughs> and Anne was just singing, we were just in heaven, you know, with me. It balanced us. That's right. That's exactly right, yeah. man. Well, man, brother, I love you so much, man. You you are the real oh, bull, man. I got you. Uh, on that one. You. you know, I think one of the blessings that, that, that the 70s gave us was that we had such power for music in the black community. That's correct. We had such we had such love that spoke to artistry, that spoke to everything, that spoke to the essence of who we are and all the, the facets of who we are. Absolutely. And um, yeah, it was a powerful time. 
it, it, it was. And, and, you know, I think it transcended, too, because one of the things that uh, about the 70s and, and George Clinton, you know, uh, on uh, wants to get funked up. I mean, he was talking about, like, can you imagine Doobie in your funk? But the Doobie uh, has a little funk. <laughs> yeah, bro. He was like, hey. You yeah. know, the Eagles, I mean, you know, the uh, Foreigner, there were so many ways yeah. that you couldn't, Michael McDonald, I mean, g I mean, there was soul, there was this unity, unity. there was this, mm, that yep. transcended color, it transcended culture, because FM radio was like, yo, we're going to go a little bit of everywhere. Absolutely. And like you said, when she came out, Earth, Wind and Fire, I mean, you're drawing from oh all of that stuff. What it was you, hitting us like crazy, yo. Yeah, so our, now now I got to ask you this question. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to keep it in the interview. We don't edit anything out, okay? So, <laughs> I mean, on, on, on the one, when when you think about the 70s, it was, to me, the greatest, and I, I don't want to be snobby, but I, I want to ask you this question from a Marlon Saunders perspective. So, you have the 70s. You grew up with all of this. Donnie Hathaway, oh, my God, right? So you, you have all of these amazing people. So when somebody brings you a piece of music today and go, man, this is the juice, this is this, what do you actually, I mean, again, music being what it is, so you're gonna accept it for what it is, but there are many times where I find myself going, well, give me your heart on <laughs> Give me your heart. I, I believe so. I think, one of the things that we have, to, we're seeing it play out today in the world. The very fact that we are now pretty much in a space where for the most part, we have to be in our own home, social distancing. We're not really, really in this space where we're connecting, where we're, fit. the very fact that we're, I mean, it's a blessing that we're being able to do this, but can you imagine if you and I were in the same room? Exactly. Hanging and feeling the energy of that vibe. I think one of the things that has happened is they were making music together. You know, they, they had to just, they had to rely on mind, body, spirit, essence That's right. of everybody. They had to listen to each other. They had to feel each other. They had to have a sense of where the beat was because they were doing it together. There's nothing yeah. wrong with how we create music today, but there's an essence of it that doesn't have the fact that there are people in a room making that music. That there is when one or two come together and on, and on a chord, something happens. We Man. know this to be so. So I think that's part of it. And also, too, top to bottom, to be able to go from the top of the song to the end of the song. Sure. I work with young artists today and they get mad at me, but I said, let's, let's go and let's sing it down. Oh, I don't know. I just can sing it. Nah, you got to know how to sing the song from the top of the song to the end of the song. The notion that everything can be done in piecemeal has shifted everything. There's nothing wrong with it. But by gaining a lot of these things, there are things that we also let go of. Man. Yeah. Now, you just hit about five of the questions that I need to ask just because of, <laughs> because, because of that. So, you know, and, and we're saying, we, we, you know, we're going to couch all of this with the greatest level of respect. Okay, so Absolutely. I'm going I'm to take Earth, Wind, and Fire, for example, who we know set the standard for many, Woo! many, many things for generations to come. Yet, you know, you have this genius in Earth, uh, you, in Maurice White, the, you know, the founder of Earth, Wind & Fire. And yet, over time, when personnel changes take place, you have a different spirit because, you know, there was this era, 75 to like 78, where it was just like, yeah. because it was these musicians at this moment in time. Now, Maurice White, prior to his passing, made a solo album and, and, and the Parkinson had not yet really taken control. But I was truly, and I, I say this from a sincere place, but I was disappointed mm -hmm. in the album. And I thought, well, this is the genius. This is the architect of what Earth, Wind & Fire was. But again, not all of the elements, the Philip Bailey, the Verde and White, all of these were in place. And you kind of thought, this is a different, mode that's going on here but you yeah. can see that with cameo when cameo were like 11 guys out of new york city yep. and when they came to three their their language was kind of limited because they didn't have the breadth of artistry mm -hmm. because they were not together gray johnson was out of the room yeah 
And as bad as Curly Singleton was, he wasn't Greg Johnson. So you needed all of those elements to say, this is the voice right here. Am I am I off on that? You're completely right. It's exactly what we were talking about before. The essence of something that's greater than one person. The essence of what motivated Maurice White to see this and to realize that it create that it needed all of this to create. Correct. For some reason, that came through at that time, and he got the vision, and it changed the world. Correct. Correct. And 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 when you listen to Earth, Wind, and Fire today, I mean, there there are still some albums that they've put out as of late, the last five years or so, that, okay, okay, we're almost there, but it'll never be what it was. And that's, again, please, mm-hmm. hear my, there's no disrespect. It's just right. saying, wow, what a moment in time that was captured. It was a moment, all in all. I mean, geez, you put that record on and it's just done. It's like, what can you do? I mean, it's like, wow, yeah. Right. That says it all. Yeah. That's it. All right, so what's in the future for Marlon Saunders? What's on the horizon, brother? What you got? Well, we have this new release um, coming in. Uh, Meditate on a Dream drops on uh, October, I think it's the 21st or 25th, somewhere in there. Uh, I actually work in with this band, Ikram and the Immigrant Groove, which is kind of like an Afro soul beat band, yeah. which is fun. You know, it's kind of like this combination of taking Mama Dubai is on bass. He's, he's amazing. Um, Ikram is percussionist. Jesso Pong's singing. And it's a great thing just to kind of, you know, create with that. Yeah. And then I kind of, you know, I think there's a project that's been in my head for a while that's involving some of the some of the younger artists from the Seamless Voice that I want to begin to start hopefully in 2021. Yeah. Um, called Black Creative Experience. The Creative Experience, is that what you said? Black. That creative experience, whatever you call it. Yeah. So we'll see how that comes together. And you have one more remix coming out, probably January 2021. Ah, is that with that, that that talented brother? I know Jerry B of Sound Doctrine. Yeah, we're going to take a more Afrocentric, you know, uh, view. Uh, we and I'm glad. I mean, you know, things happen for a reason. My my beautiful wife, you know, her her father died while we were, you know, we had that up on the front burner, and uh, so there were some things that we needed to, you know, make sure at some point for family. Uh, but with respect to stripping it back down, and that's what I love. I do love that aspect of technology where you can strip yeah. it back down and say, okay, all right, that was cool, but that was too close to the original. I think that the I think that the melody that you created and the way that you sung those lyrics needs a completely different uh, approach. And it begins with the drum because the timing is is in nine. <laughs> you know I mean? And so, yes. you know, be prepared in a couple of weeks to hear hear something completely. Well, I mean, the genius coming out of your mind, coming through, downloading through you, I'm completely going to be blown away. As when I went back to listen, oh, you know, over the last month, I was completely blown away. It's a beautiful song. Like, wow. It's a beautiful song. It really is. It really is. Man. Well, thank you so much it's for being good. A major part of of who I am as a fellow musician, man. I vibe off of you. I listen to you when you don't. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about CDs, man. Both albums still speak to me just like they did in 2003, 2007. Thank you for sharing your artistry with me. Thank you for just being, like I said in the beginning, for just being who you are, what you do creatively, how your mind is always thinking of incredible new things to share with folks. I just really appreciate you. I appreciate your music. I appreciate your genius. And I appreciate your love, brother. I really do. Absolutely. Well, peace and blessings to you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Marlon Saunders, okay? He is the ultra entree musician. So, oh, oh, wait, let me, let me ask this question. As I close, how do people get in touch with you? Because I want, I, I know yeah. the seamless voice is doing some great things. I want people to get in touch with you. So how would you do that? How, how can they do it? You know, I would say just marlonsaunders.com is the easiest way. That's my website. And for those that are like, you know, social media bound, the best way is Instagram, Marlon Saunders at Instagram. Yeah, man. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I tried to close the show without saying this is how you get in touch with them. 
everything. <laughs> Marlon Saunders, MarlonSaunders.com, Instagram, uh, the seamless voice. If you if you require some lessons, because he is still teaching, and uh, yeah. yo, you want to benefit from his spirit. We're so grateful to have him on the Entree Musician. Peace and blessings to you. You know we're going to see you next time. God bless, Peace, brother. Bless. Peace.